Welcome everybody. I'm so happy that you are all here to share with us this wonderful event, our closing event of the Safe Spaces, uh, Ruimte voor uh, uh, Spaces in the City. Sorry, <laughs> we are connecting. Um, um, thank you to have you here. My name is Indira van het Klooster, director of ARCAM, the Architecture Center in Amsterdam. We have this wonderful panel here to do the closing event of Safe Spaces. And um, uh, this is actually the, the last of, uh, of a series of four in which we have uh, discovered and looked at, discussed um, all sorts of uh, aspects of the uh, exhibition on exactly what is safety, what's the difference between being safe and feeling safe, uh, on uh, um, uh, examples from history, on free spaces, and how to design for free space and tolerant open cities. And today we will be talking about feminist space. We have a uh, beautiful guests. I will introduce you to, uh, to them to you later. Uh, but a very, very wonderful welcome to Joss Boyce, who came from London, our first international guest since uh, at least two years, I'd say, uh, uh, with, of course, also the help of the, the new Institute and, and the email team publisher. So we're really, really happy to have you here. Uh, you will be the second uh, speaker of this um, uh, one hour event. We, I'd like to start with Ali Assad, the co-curator of the exhibition, and also um, um, uh, one of the designers of the installation on the Moederhuis, Aldo van Eyck and Harney van Eyck. So the first five bidders are yours to, uh, uh, to, to start off from the Moederhuis to feminist space, and then Jos Boys will take over. Ali. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Adira, for that warm introduction. <laughs> um, I'd like to preface my presentation today with two facts. Um, first, that I'm a researcher and a feminist not a feminist researcher or an activist. Um, and that my involvement in this project really came about from a very generous invitation to collaborate with a fantastic team here, but also from a real curiosity and passion to understand Dutch society through its built environments. Um, safety is not necessarily um, the most pertinent factor in, understanding, in an understanding of a culture, but when it's explored in relationship to representation, to visibility, to social justice, an understanding of safety inherently becomes an understanding of the tenets of society, of its democracy, of its humanity. And the contradiction that I've personally always felt as a practicing architect um, embodied in the practice of architecture is that we traditionally have chosen to focus more on big buildings than to focus on the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is effectively the most compelling design project our collective design project and all the rightful claims to space that we make within that. The cornerstone of my invitation, as you suggested as well, uh, was the architectural installation we called Kaleidoscope. Uh, Kaleidoscope was designed by the Curatorial Research Collective at TU Eindhoven, uh, of which I am a member, and was originally conceived for Dutch Design Week uh, 2020. As an installation, it explores the intimacy of the Hubertus House, or the Motor House, as it's more commonly referred to. A refuge for, um, um, that, would be, that would provide a safe environment for pregnant women and single mothers uh, in precarious situations that was built between 1973 and 1981. The late director of the Hubertus Association, the client of the project, so to speak, said a very specific brief to the architect. Uh, the brief was conscious of a duality between an intimacy and a visibility that would, need, that would be needed to embrace these women in society. Um, it's a contradictory claim, she admitted herself, but one which is at the core of their work, to take women out of society and give them an interior, which means closeness, but from that very moment to prepare them for their return to society, which means openness. The resulting project is an architectural response to what is inherently a social but intrinsically physical imperative, one which re-examines our own notions of safety and intimacy with a visibility, a reciprocal relationship to the city and the urban condition, not shying away behind another anonymous facade, but actually celebrating the visibility of these women, of this association, um, through a kaleidoscopic geography of rainbow hues and open glass. This became the imperative for us as uh, designers and architects in the collective, but also as the curatorial team here at Arkham, to explore how this one building 
this one thread of a microhistory of safety and visibility for those women who inhabited it exists within a tapestry or a broader macro culture of emancipatory architectures, spaces, and actions in the city. With its emblematic rainbow spectrum of visibility and pride, kaleidoscope became the scaffold with which we literally and figuratively present these moments, these milestones or, and visibilities and claims to space in the city and within society. Following a conventional classification system, we categorized the different vulnerable or other social groups constituting the multiple facets of Dutch society, um, and that felt immediately logical to us. It's a taxonomy that allowed us all in the curatorial team to identify, classify, and depict each one of them within a specific timeline. Um, I won't turn this into a, a, a history class, mostly because I don't feel like on this panel I am the person who is most adapted giving one. Um, but rather, I'd like to reflect on what this taxonomy actually instilled in me, uh, which is an urgency for more lateral type of research. Um, it really gave me an understanding of my own limitations as a, a researcher, the limitations of research practice, um, but more importantly, what it's taught me about intersectionality. Um, these taxonomies establish very specific groups and peoples within identifiable systems and labels, which undoubtedly is um, divides and segments this kind of macro culture into smaller micro histories. When in fact, I think what we were really trying to achieve was the exact opposite, to unify these different micro histories into a greater understanding of the history of safety and visibility in Amsterdam for all these different social groups. Micro history in itself, a term coined by a scholar Amy Stanley, is a way of recuperating narrative. It's a way in which narrative, gender history, and global history should work together. Uh, I'd like to stress that also this is not necessarily a critique as such, uh, but a personal reflection of the inherent violences that come with very active classification of trying to describe um, Amsterdamer history of, say, women and gender identity that inherently sets its protagonists as separate or other, not just to society as a whole, but to one another. Um, the 1913 uh, exhibition de Vrau, uh, conceived by feminists Rosa Manus and Mia Bosseman, detailed the contribution of women towards the birth and development of the nation. They highlighted the role that women, Dutch women, played in the colonies. I mean, this is undoubtedly indicative of its time. This didn't include a representation of women from different ethnic minorities. It did not detail the contribution, voluntary or otherwise, to the national construct of these women. And despite the resonance and significance of this, this exhibition uh, towards the feminist movement and women's suffrage in the Netherlands, it starts to become an indicator of a pattern that permeates through the rest of the century and that continues to this day, and which inherently frames the Dutch feminist framework as predominantly white. Um, it's not strange to examine how a group like Dolomina, a Dutch feminist group that campaigned for equal rights for women through all these playful and radical kind of protests and demonstrations, they fit perfectly well into this group. Groups like Stop the Kindermut, in part also a feminist movement, fits well into this category. But within this narrative outlook, or a visibility in the city of these louder, potentially more impactful voices, can we not actually disregard the more nuanced gestures, the safeties that manifested without visibility, that were short-lived, that lay dormant, those which had not been culturally afforded their space in society, nor their rightful place in the city. One of the projects we included was that of Ashanti, an independent Marxist women's magazine for and by Surinamese women that was not only born out of the need to reach women and make their voices heard, but stemmed from a real dissatisfaction with um, this dominant white feminist framework. These women created space in any way that they could, and the effects that they had did not resonate across the city, and they did not make headlines. The historiography on the women's liberation movement in the Netherlands tends to overlook these micro-histories, or continues to class them beyond feminist movements and waves of the 20th century, because they fit in a better box in a more seemingly clean box 
which is the emergence of um, black and migrant ethnic minority movements. So it's not necessarily a historical um, othering, it is, but it's also a historiographic othering that continues to this day. It's a sustained reading of a feminist framework that displaces the women of, of color from this narrative. And not just women of color, but also women from the LGBTQI community. Going back to this metaphor of what, neat, what fits neatly in the box, with a feminist lens, what would become of a history of all the collectives and initiatives by lesbian women, by trans women or queer Muslim women? Where do you place sister outsider? Where do you place flamboyant? The first black and migrant women center in Amsterdam, hidden away behind an anonymous facade on the Sinkel just down the road, which also had a library and a documentation center. Where to fit strange fruit? a group created by queer, Muslim, and Afro-Caribbean youth who felt marginalized within the society they live in. The networks that these activists built with one another, with other women, with other women of color, with promoting not only lesbian interests or trans interests, but providing space, safe spaces for trans women, for these women, linking African, black, Moroccan, Arab, and Turkish women across the country. The history of these women and many more of these women is not lost to feminist history. It is only theoretically erased when we misplace it, when our historiography puts it in a different box. And we continue to float on how universal these single categorical axes are, and we continue to marginalize the intersections between race and gender, between religion and sexuality, and gender identity. So um, I prefaced my, my presentation with the statement that I am not an activist, <laughs> and that I am a researcher, but if I was an activist, I would be an activist not only for more inclusive cities, but for a more inclusive understanding of our histories. And I say our histories, Dutch history specifically in this context. Um, not to project the polemics of today, there's no way you could evaluate the past in the same, with the same lens with which you view the present, but to really understand that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle, because none of us live single issue lives. And I'm going to quote Flazia Zotan's fantastic seminal words, which are, my feminism will be intersectional, or it'll be bullshit. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Let's <laughs> give you a from this table. <laughs> we have this a little technical uh, confusion that we cannot see ourselves, nor can see anything that's happening in the audience. So we feel a little bit disconnected, which is actually even more strange mm. because of your heartfelt uh, uh, presentation on, uh, on, on history, misplaced history, history in boxes put aside and how to bring it back, how to, to bring all these micro-history, um, uh, um, forgotten history, immaterial history mm. back into the, the, uh, a much more uh, public framework, let's say. So uh, being kind of trapped somewhere uh, in, 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 in Zoom lives, this is really, really, really vital. Uh, and I would really like uh, uh, to invite Jos Boys to, to, to follow up on this uh, as an architect, an, an, archivist, an activist, a founding member of Matrix, uh, and also uh, connected to Bartlett University. You made uh, uh, an exhibition uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Barbican called How We Live Now, Reimagining Spaces with Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative. Lovely. Thank you very much, and thank you, Ali. I, um, uh, I'd like us all to hold the thoughts around intersectionality, because I think we'll definitely come back to that. And uh, one of the things that's interesting around Matrix, I think, um, is that it's partly its period, that it was developed in the 70s and the 80s in London. Uh, and I think in many ways it was very intersectional, but the debates very much were women and or gender and, and that tends immediately to lock you into those sorts labels. of those labels and those debates, even though that's not, I think, what was often going on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the exhibition at the Barbican because it's just, it feels like a really lovely set of overlaps between what's happening here with uh, Safe Spaces and what we were doing. It feels like there's a whole lot of different things going on really across Europe where these things are kind of bubbling up to the surface again, as they have again and again. Um, so the show How We Live Now is at the Barbican Arts Centre in London. It's run from May until December. 
It's free and it's in the foyer, so if you happen to go, please go and see it if you happen to be in London. Um, and its aim really is also part of opening up um, some of the spaces within the Barbican Art Centre to a much wider audience. Uh, it was, I co-curated it with the Barbican uh, architecture and design curator, John Asprey, who did a huge amount of the work. Um, in terms of the show itself, I just wanted to say a few things. Um, we had quite an unusual development process and I think actually talking to Ali some of the things were very similar and maybe that's something about these kinds of approaches and this kind of way of redefining the canon. So um, the archival material that's there was literally being collected at the same time as it was being put into the show. Um, uh, and John and I and a lot of other women who'd been involved in Matrix in some time, uh, for some time were searching in our cupboards and our attics and under our beds and seeing if we had anything. And then, you know, the show would be, we'd begin to decide what would go in and then somebody say, oh, look what I've just found. Um, so it's kind of that that whole thing about that kind of, uh, feminist practice and I think community-based practice which is a lot of the artifacts can be quite ephemeral and um, and they do they just disappear they and that's part of how they stop being part of the canon nobody's interested in collecting them so it felt very hand-to-mouth and it's done and it's very much uh, John's kind of uh, aesthetic it's done almost like a kind of scrapbook or a collage. And collaging was one of the methods that Matrix used quite a lot. But it was also because he wasn't quite sure what he was going to get to be able to put in the show. We also wanted to reflect the kind of how Matrix worked, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit in a minute, in the design of the show. And most straightforwardly, that was that it was designed by uh, an all-female team, uh, Edit Collective, and that the installation was by women builders and the other elements, the curtains and other things also, all developed by uh, women. It very much tries to show work in progress. I think one of the things about uh, Matrix, as a lot of practices and uh, uh, community action at the time, was that um, it was about the process. It wasn't necessarily about the final product, although it mattered that that was of high quality too. Uh, we also tried to reinvent the notion of the catalogue. Um, this was also done by Edit Collective and was partly to do with the pandemic and I think was very powerful. It's like a learning from the pandemic that we do again. So it's actually, it's called the at-home pack. It's uh, called Revealing Objects. And the idea of it is it's lots of activities that you can do if you can't get to the show. And they're very wide-ranging activities that you might do um, with your friends or with children. Um, or go, for, you know, in terms of taking a walk. And the other connected piece of work, which obviously relates to this issue of just whether we could find anything, is the Matrix Open Online Archive, which we got some money from the Bartlett School of Architecture at UCL to develop a prototype. And it's still very much a prototype stage. But the idea is that anything that we find that people might want to have access to can be downloaded. We're not, we're not um, interested in kind of just high-level scholarship where you have to go and dig away in an archive and get special permission. And... Um, the idea is it is, it's something that just anybody can get at uh, and get material in, in kind of a quite high resolution so they can use it as they wish. Um, and it comes also with a kind of blog and a way of adding more entries that accumulate more and more information. So a little bit about Matrix so that it makes sense why I'm talking about the exhibition. Matrix was a... Uh, it came in many different forms, so uh, although it now has this single name, it came, it was originally a kind of quite a large group, uh, quite a mixed group of women uh, who'd been involved in the new architecture movement in the U UK and wanted to actually think about the feminist implications of that. Um, and the design practice itself, which is uh, the black and white picture that you can see, on the left-hand side, I'm not quite sure which way round everybody's seeing it. Uh, that's uh, some of the women who were involved at, at one particular period, but the design practice started in 81, and then as funding got harder and harder, public funding folded in, in 93. Um, one of the things that we tried to do was just work together. Uh, we wrote a book called Making Space, and that was really to try and work out 
what it was that, was that we were looking at when we were looking at things like gender or race in the built environment. What was going on here? This was a time when the word sexism didn't exist. And there was a kind of assumption in the built environment professions that, um, that it was that built environment was completely neutral, that it didn't really make any difference. You know, there, wasn't, there weren't any issues about difference. Um, and at the bottom, you can see two women building. Uh, there was a lot of, idea, of interest in interconnection and networking across architecture, into construction, into planning, that these things shouldn't be dealt with separately. And finally, and I think very importantly, there were a whole set of things about different ways of working, which were about empowering people who'd not had any training in the profession. Very unlikely that people would be able to read plans, that they would know, they'd understand scale. So using things like models, and um, different sorts of techniques with string and ribbons and to help people understand scale. Uh, just to pass on, really, the, uh, and make equal the decision-making about buildings. I was just going to give one example. This is the Jaganari Asian Women's Centre in um, East London. And this was probably one of Matrix's biggest jobs, completely uh, engaged with the client. Originally, they thought they were just going to get a series of porter cabins, and they were able, um, with support from Matrix, to get much larger funding for a, a quite large building. And that included uh, a whole lot of just really nice ways of sharing decision-making. So they went on what was called a brick picnic, with the idea that you could... that. They'd go, that everybody went to look at buildings and discussed uh, what, what kinds of colours of bricks and mortar they liked. Um, the book, Making Space, Women in the Man-Made Environment, was a kind of, uh, just a moment really in the, this whole series of processes and is, has been out of print for some time but is just about to be republished by Verso Feminist Classics uh, next spring. Uh, one of the things we want to do in the exhibition is see this as part of, you know, Matrix isn't, um, in many ways it wasn't special for that period. There were lots of other things going on internationally, but also even in London. And so we wanted to, in the exhibition, we talk about connected activities that are happening at the time, but have also happened since, that this is not a one-off. Matrix is not foundational. It's part of a whole series of ongoing debates that come and go and get lost and have to be reinvented and reinvented in different contexts. And so the top pictures are uh, design work by Anne Thorne Architects, um, one from immediately after Matrix and one much more recently. And the, uh, Anne and Fran, who were both founder members of Matrix, have since then run their own practice. That's been an all-female practice just doing... Um, you know, really important work. And the uh, images at the bottom, I could have picked so many. It's Black Females in Architecture, which is a UK-based organisation for uh, women of colour in architecture, and Maikette from uh, Sweden, who uh, look at the notions of queer space and how you might do it. But as I say, uh, there could be tens, 20 different examples there. So finally, I just wanted to raise the issues of, well, what has changed? And I'm thinking about this particularly around gender, but I think, you know, again, we need to revisit the inter intersectional elements. Um, you know, the white middle-class housewife, I think, interestingly, in the pandemic, it's been really clear that women have been put back into those, you know, looking after the house and looking after the children roles, even if they've got full-time jobs. If they're back in the home, that somehow falls to their place. But obviously, we also know that it's really different, the experiences of middle-class white women and working-class women and women of colour in terms of what those, what kind of roles they're assumed to have. Um, we, there's an issue about the city and, and how it is or isn't still supporting uh, n the non-normative and disadvantaged groups. And the, there's a series of issues that continue around the built environment professions and the assumptions they make about uh, what people should be doing and where they should be doing it. Um, uh, and I think we'll come back to a discussion about the archive and um, what kinds of things we should be saving and why we and how we manage to do that. Thank you, Joss. Thank you very much so much. Uh, where, where, where Ali um, um, 
uh, emphasize the limitation of research practice. Maybe you em emphasize the limitations of architectural practice <laughs> yes. within this uh, world where uh, um, uh, uh, buildings reflect uh, dominant values and, and, and how it difficult it is to, to find ways to empower minority voices or unheard voices. Um, uh, you are both looking back in history and, and George, you already started in looking at what kind of lessons can we take, mm -hmm. or what kind of realizations, processes are valuable uh, within the things you have learned from uh, Ali from Safe Spaces and, and his other research and you from, from Matrix. What would be maybe the most relevant uh, um, realization maybe or act to take to art today and tomorrow? Um, I think that's such a big question and I think for me, I mean this word value, I have a feeling is going to come up a lot in different ways and the way that I use it a lot and, and I've done a lot of work recently with the Disordinary Architecture Project, we think about who gets valued and who doesn't in society. So not just about financial value but what intangible social value but also just built in assumptions and norms about who counts and who doesn't, who sometimes, who somehow gets just forgotten or left out. And I think that the, for me, um, and I can do this because I'm an academic, I'm not a professional designer, or I don't work in, uh, you know, the, I'm not a city designer, I don't work in those fields, I'm not a policy maker, but for me, I want to be endlessly critical of the everyday language that we drop into. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, we, you know, we have this notion of inclusion, but I already find, you know, just as Ali, you were talking about intersectionality, for me, inclusion is, as a word, is a problematic word because, you know, mm -hmm. I am here and I include other people. Mm -hmm. They adapt to me. They become included in my world and I don't have a change at all. So we use, it's, you know, these things are so buried into the language we use about the built environment that we have to, we have to kind of pick ourselves up all the time and say... Are we making assumptions? It's the common sense assumptions in the language we're using mm -hmm. that we need to shift. And not just the language, but the way that actually translates into components of, of building practice, of the way cities are conceived, the way, I mean, I'm, I, I want to draw back to those, those wonderful images, I mean, terrible images, <laughs> but um, the, the alphabet of sexism that you had on the, the bottom left corner of the screen there, that seems diabolical like why would you teach a child that <laughs> and uh, really kind of see what we're up against really yeah. and that it really there there's a whole generation where that was very much um exposed to this level of of toxicity that doesn't necessarily deal with it on on like the basic kind of linguistic levels but really is ingrained with this kind of level of understanding that a woman should not pick up a meccano set yeah. but was it was it yeah cannot build cannot use a workshop I mean, they're horrific. Yeah. And I think, I mean, what, what, you know, it is that thing about what has changed and mm. what hasn't. And some of those things mm. definitely still go on. Definitely. It's still, it's mm. not the same. You know, Anne Thorne talks about the early days of Matrix when she would go on site and there would be pictures of, in all the builders' offices of uh, uh, sexist adverts of kind of naked women draped mm. over piles of bricks. And, <laughs> and there would be a lot of wolf whistling and the men, the men on site would, mm. were felt completely able to be mm. very rude to her. And she would be the only woman on a site with, you know, 200 workers and, you know. Um, and that, it's, not, it's not as bad as that now, but the mm. idea that... Uh, so you don't, you know, well, you don't quite get the same sexist ads um, but the idea that somehow if you're female you have to work twice as hard, and of course if you're a woman of colour, mm -hmm. like six times as hard, mm -hmm. to just endlessly prove yourself, I think that's still true. I think it does. I think it does ring true. Mm -hmm. Because of the time, I think we, we, it, 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 uh, that we have maybe uh, in, in you, your uh, uh, projects and work looked at, um, at, at the historical um, appearance and disappearance of, of groups. Um, to, now it would, might be a good uh, idea to, to see how today uh, uh, feminist practice and activism appears and for that we have um, invited uh, Bogomir Dorinja to, to um, present a small project. I hope you can see him because we can't. Can, can the audience see Bogomir? Zoom? Yeah? Yes. Hi Bogomir, hi. Can you, can you hear us? Can you see us? We can't hear you? I can hear you, and I hear you in, as an echo, and I saw you in delay, so this no is really a kind of sci-fi. 
Uh, you can't hear me? I don't think he can hear us either. <laughs> wait, wait, just a second. Are you able to hear me now? Are you or able to hear me? Is it not a problem that he cannot hear us? Can the audience hear Bogomir? We don't know. <laughs> can you hear okay. me? Ah. Mm. Yeah, we're, 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 we're trying to find a way through all the technical uh, um, complications, but there you are, Bogomir. Uh, I'm very, very um, happy that you are here um, uh, um, presenting to us from Belgrado. So, uh, 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 very nice as, as, a, as, a, as a sociologist and an artist, and part of the exhibition as well here in Safe Spaces. Um, uh, we asked you to, uh, to focus on the, uh, on the specific uh, element of, 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 of feminist activism within your work. So, I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor to you now, and I hope that you can hear us, and we can see you, and the audience can do that as well. Yes, okay, so let's yes. try again. I was just saying that there is the slight delay and echo, so it was uh, it was quite challenging to follow the previous presentations. Uh, but yeah, if you hear me and if you can see me, and plus if you are able to see my slides, which I will be sharing now with you, uh, then, then everything is fine. So are you able to see this? Yes, we can see you and hear you and see the slides, so we are happy. Okay. Okay, great. So yeah, anyway, actually it's interesting that I'm in Belgrade because the, the whole research that I was obsessed with the last few years did start from an experience um, of uh, bombing, of NATO bombing of Belgrade. So I will just shortly introduce, so, so my research started under the title I Dance Alone and then it turned into a dance of urgency. Um, I guess we can all relate to the title I Dance Alone now in times of COVID, where during the lockdowns we were dancing on our own at home or in front of computer. But I think we can also understand dance of urgency on international level now, uh, what it means to not be allowed to move, to not have uh, freedom of movement or not have a chance to participate in a collective dance. So um, during NATO bombing of Belgrade in 1999, uh, I actually learned to dance. So instead of going to shelters, uh, we would end up in a techno club called Industria and collectively dance. And um, for me, it was really important to understand what that dance was, because once I moved to Amsterdam, uh, the function of a dance changed, the purpose of a dance changed, but also the movement in a way stopped. So um, if we look into dances by definition that we kind of accepted, which is the dance can be performative and participatory, and then we have all these functions that could be a social dance, ceremonial, erotic, liturgical, competitive, martial. What is missing is political. And um, after the recent protest in Amsterdam where like 150,000 people danced on the street, I'm actually sure that deleting of this political is intentionally done by educational models, by government, by church, by families, by history, because the dancing itself is a ritual indeed can be quite dangerous and threatening to the system. So um, I look as a dance, um, it, it, let's say if we understand dance as the way of socializing, as a kind of nonverbal communication, as an art form, as a ritualistic practice, um, we still never really look into the dances that happen on the dance floors in the night. So we don't really try to understand what these individuals and crowds are expressing, what moves them, what doesn't move them, how it moves them. So what do the people in clubs move for? Um, and I think that by looking into dance of people in clubs or festivals, um, we can see that some of these dances are reflection and some reaction to the social political environment and struggles of individuals and groups. So in a way, the most of famous dances that we know today, so from, you know, cramping, voguing, uh, even gabber dance in a way, uh, they all came from some kind of music uh, and resistance. Um, also, if we think of music directions such as jazz, soul, uh, hip hop, house, techno, uh, they pretty much came from um, um, African-American community and struggles that 
uh, this community experienced. So um, by attaching the camera above the dance floor and looking into crowds almost as a cloud, um, I, I had this theory that we can kind of predict what kind of weather is coming, that the more the crowds will be expressive and wild, the more these crowds will be communicating or translating something. Uh, but also by looking into dance floor, I recognize what is missing or who is missing on a dance floor. So why there is not that many women on a dance floor, what's happening with queer community, why cities like Amsterdam that is so uh, multicultural and diverse has mostly uh, uh, white people on the dance floor um, and, um, and I also started being obsessed with documenting these rituals and extracting a knowledge and ideas out of them. And also recognizing that some of these places, I heard that the word values was, was mentioned, that some of these places have really uh, um, um, uh, decided values and aim of what these dances are for or what these dances are about. So there is almost like a social political urgency around them. And some are nothing else than just actually economic models for selling of a lot of different beers like Heineken most of the time. I'm showing this video because this is a moment where one girl dancing alone in a club feels comfortable and safe enough to enter this state of trance and kind of transform uh, um, 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 transform her uh, feelings into the dance. Um, so dance of urgency is basically a dance that rises from emotions um, that occur in times of personal and collective crisis, as such a dance empowers individuals and uh, collectives. This dance is not constant. So the idea that dance is there to help you dealing with the pain is very uh, important to me. Uh, this is, for example, an example of crowd gathering in Tbilisi in Georgia um, uh, that was initiated by one techno club called Bassiani, where Nadia Orashvili um, is one of the founders. And for her, finding the way how to choreograph crowd, how to non-verbally uh, unite the crowd, unite trans sex workers together with women, together with gays, together with hooligans, and create a space where these different groups can practice to be and move together was very important. So I'm also showing the photo of Nadia uh, kind of deleting with one hand move a person that is trying to interrupt this protest. This protest went in different directions and went into female empowerment, into change of the drug policies, but it also uh, showed how, um, how important and politically active this dancing crowd is. Um, so I'm not sure if you're able to see really videos, but I, I decided to, trans, uh, to change them for still images. So this is an example of dancing crowd in front of Georgian parliament that for two days danced to, um, uh, to fight for the freedom of movement and for maintenance of these techno places, techno clubs. But also I see that the dancing crowds, the clubs are in a way or spaces for preparation of collective body to exit to, into the streets and fight, or a form of a formalin where we practice to maintain this collectivism and social political urgency. So this is example of uh, Lastesis Collective um, that basically started in a nightlife and it started in the clubs. And then in 2019, they performed um, um, a, 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 Big, uh, um, they took the streets of Chile and they performed the song You're a Rapist that directly addresses uh, the um, a large amount of femicide, uh, rape, um, and also kind of, um, uh, yeah, how unsafe actually streets and how unsafe Chile is for women. What's interesting about this movement is that by watching these dancing crowds, we embody the movement and we perform it somewhere else. Uh, so um, these crowds tend to multiply in the same way as the dance multiplies, you know, by watching somebody dances, you take the moves and you start dancing in a similar way. So these protests happened all over the uh, world in the last two years. 
Um, and um, it brought also this discussion of, you know, how safe our institutions, our environments are. Uh, even if we think about Netherlands, I mean, last year, the cases of sexual harassment, abuse and rape uh, that was hidden and happening in art academia um, uh, just exploded. And so, so it kind of, um, even though this movement seemed very far away, it kind of does resonate from the screen into us and through our bodies into the space where we live. Um, so yeah, that's, I tried to be, uh, I had like five minutes or something. So I hope that I managed to, um, yeah, to bring these ideas, yeah. Thank you, Bogomir. Thank you so much. Uh, what, 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 what you've done so far now is uh, talking about visibility and how, in the, ex in the case of the exhibitions, how we have literally unboxed history and put it uh, uh, on, on, um, uh, on panels and on show and in, in dance. It's also about uh, in, uh, visibility and how it goes from, from underground and maybe private uh, expression to uh, on the streets and political collective expression. So visibility uh, in, in, in many ways and in many um, uh, dimensions. Uh, once we are there, um, it is also about words. And um, at uh, uh, Arkham, we did the um, uh, Spatial Practice uh, Feminist Book Club from uh, Afaina de Jong. And uh, Afaina de Jong is an architect and she wanted to um, uh, explore more what exactly could that be a feminist practice? How would you design for a feminist city? And uh, we have invited three uh, 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 architects that took part in the bookshop to uh, select one word uh, that is part of this uh, book club that actually could give words, new words to uh, uh, all the examples that we have seen so far. And uh, Marisa Courtright, uh, also on Zoom, um, is the first person to address. So, so Marisa, very much welcome into the uh, show and uh, please explain us your word. if she's there, or we can hear her. We can, we can see you, Marisa, but we can't hear you. We can Thank also you, see Indira. you. I'm yes. also just dealing with the <laughs> um, gap between the live stream and the Zoom, so I hope you're hearing me okay, because I don't hear you. I'll try to just be brief, and I think you have up my image. I chose to show this image of a print that was produced by the TU Delft feminists, and it's entitled Architecture is for Everybody. That accompanies my text, and the, the word that I wanted to bring out from my text is the architectural killjoy. That's a me paraphrasing Sarah Ahmed's feminist killjoy, but I think the purpose of bringing these together is that in saying architecture is for everybody, we're also saying that, in fact, it's it's not, but it should be. Um, there's there's this discrepancy kind of inherent in the statement. And what the figure of Ahmed's feminist killjoy and my architectural killjoy is meant to do is to point out this discrepancy. It's this person who keeps saying, actually, this isn't what it says it is. To again, paraphrase Ahmed, you can't always close the gap between how architecture or anything really is and how it should be. Behind the sharpness of this cannot is a world of possibility. And for me, it's the figure of the killjoy who turns the cannot into perhaps I can, I can close that gap, I can, change that discrepancy. And finally, the killjoy, whether they're working in architecture or in another field, is often made by people in power to appear as the problem. So the problem that architecture is not for everybody becomes the problem of the people that architecture is not for. This is what Yoss was pointing out earlier. Um, so by insisting that architecture is for everybody, the TU Del Feminists simultaneously claimed that it has not been for everyone, nor is it currently, but that if it is to be redeemed, if it is to be valuable, uh, it must become so, and, and that it will be killjoys who make it so. That's, that's my, my thought on the image. I'll mute myself again. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marisa. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll switch to, to, the, to the table now, back to 
uh, the, the, the event space here at ARCOM. Please stay with us uh, for the later uh, discussion. Um, Stephanie, uh, very welcome here at the table. I hope the audience can see us. Uh, please present us your words. Some, I will, we will collect them and then, then we'll collect Joe's and then we'll bring it back into the, the, the discussion. my text out loud and I see my <laughs> iPad isn't uh, collaborating so I have technical issues on a different level here. I may but have it here for you, would that help? I'm good, thank ah, you. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, for me the book club, it not only enriched my vocabulary, what we were talking about, that vocabulary doesn't only um, uh, mean that you're limited in what you say, but also in what you think. Uh, so it enriched my thinking, but especially talking it over afterwards, what we read with the others, not only architects, but also sociologists or uh, historic, uh, his historicists. That was especially refreshing uh, to look at my profession of architecture from a different perspective. Uh, and uh, my thoughts, I tried to write them down for the exhibition and reflected on it with Joe and Marissa. So I thought I will just read it for mm -hmm. you. Whenever we discuss claiming space in cities for marginalized minorities, shouldn't we be talking about sharing space? And how do we consider, consider nature in this debate? To, tru to truly share spaces, a consideration of the terms of coexistence, inclusion and exclusion is offered by Nirmal Puar, one of the writers that we discussed. She emphasizes that outsiders are excluded, not only by fiscal, but also by, by implicit imaginary boundaries. She discusses the emancipation of minorities and the resistance they encounter when entering politics and other prominent positions in society. These borders are social, social constructs, which are constantly being crossed, change over time, and are replaced by new constructs, which must then be crossed, crossed by outsiders who are not fully embraced as insiders. When these space invaders enter the natural habitat of another, certain social spatial processes emerge. As a matter out of place, they provoke disorientation, shift perspective and invite reflection on the definition of self in relation to the other, space and nature. An examination of these social processes allows us to redefine, or better yet, exceed our spatial design methods. Indeed, a transdisciplinary approach might or may allow us to start comprehending the dynamics of diversity and biodiversity in cities. It may even help us to imagine a future in which not only humans, but all natural beings live in symbiosis. Thank you very much, Stephanie. So, so far we have uh, collected uh, Killjoy, we have imaginary boundaries, we have uh, space invaders. Joe, what will be your words? Um, could I say something a little bit about the reading group? Mm -hmm. uh, I joined the reading group and for me as a practicing architect and teacher of architectural design, I found it so refreshing to uh, use evaluation and reflection on my own practice. Uh, very often I don't get the opportunity to read these texts, to think about them, and to discuss them in an environment with a group which is very warm, very open, it was very relaxed, and we weren't under an enormous amount of pressure. It was great, and a really lovely sele selection of books from a few. And so I really enjoyed it immensely. It's a shame you can't carry on forever. <laughs> there you go. And then we were kindly, the three of us, of words that that struck us and also uh, might resonate with us in terms of our own practice. And the words I chose were straightening devices, margins and misfits. And of course there's quite a lot of crossover between what I chose and Mariska and uh, Stephanie chose. And I'll read very, very briefly um, what I wrote. And, just to say that the discussion we had in the reading group was very informal, very open, and we, as us three, had an opportunity to sharpen a little bit on reflection what, uh, what we picked. So um, I'd like to say something about straightening devices, margins and misfits, which were words selected from Sarah Ahmed's text 
and also from the text of Leslie Kern, Kern's book, Feminist City. So the writer and feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed uses the term straightening devices, and it can be applied to design and the built environment. And as such, how the training, so I'm a teacher, so that interests me, tra the training, the practice, and consumption of architecture as a discipline perpetuates and imposes a certain kind of conformity. This gives huge advantages within the built environment to those among us who are already deeply privileged. Those on the margins, as Leslie Kern calls them, have our disadvantages compounded by a built environment that often makes us feel excluded as mis misfits. To be aware of what is this is ha actually happening is at the very least, begins, it begins to loosen this grip of these insidious straightening devices that exist all around us. However, it is not enough to retrofit the built environment to take on the needs of those who are on the margins or as they do or do not become apparent. And I'm thinking here, it's like clipping on your um, wheelchair access after the building's been designed. It should be not relegated to merely a technical and regulatory add-on to the design process. A recognition of the intersectional issues that will in the end be of benefit to us all and must be at the core of how we approach design. So it's embedded in actually how we begin to think about buildings, not something later. Oh, we've made a mistake. Let's, let's try and rectify it with a bit more extra lighting. The built environment will, in the end, only be truly accessible when it begin, brings to the needs of those on the margins to the very heart and centre of design practice and also design procurement. So this is my take on straightening devices, margins and misfits. And I found the whole exercise such a wonderful way of reflecting and looking at these things, these texts, and how evaluation is a design tool, eventually. Yeah, and, and how um, um, a design tool also needs a new vocabulary. You both Absolutely. mentioned that uh, yeah. in, in your earlier speeches as well, because uh, a new fac vocabulary is also a way of unboxing history, of uh, regaining visibility, but also creating an awareness of yes. what exactly do I think, what do I say, when do I say it, what does it mean? And as such, a new, uh, let's say, critical reflection and then new values. So, um, um, these words that we have collected in the in the reading group are, of course, uh, I think, quite familiar uh, uh, to to both of you. Um, uh, I, 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 I checked it and on several spaces in my well, like my, my surroundings and people that I know. But how many? How much? Uh, how often do they use these words? Like really in conversations? How, how is that for you? Do, is it? Are these words that you actively use, like like in everyday conversations? They're words that I personally try to use um, and try to maybe infiltrate certain types of discussions with specific mm. types of people with, but it's definitely not something that has permeated through mm. public discourse or it's not in common parlance. These, these terms are quite loaded. They're mm. also potentially quite difficult terms to deal with. And Joss, uh, I think, said something about redefining the canon, and I think that's mm. exactly where it stands. It's yeah. these, these ideas that these linguistic structures, these restrictions that hold us back, the way we define things in certain terms or through certain realities, I think that's something that needs to, that's constantly in flux. Yeah. I mean, also you spoke about imaginary boundaries. This idea of the canon in itself, this <laughs> imaginary boundary of the canon, like who defines <laughs> the canon? Mm -hmm. Collectively, somehow, we believe something has merit or value because, <clears throat> because someone told us so, maybe. And I think it's, it's wonderful that you have this opportunity to kind of engage with these texts and without a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, I mean, queer phenomenology is a text that I think if, if you were pressured to read is quite a difficult text to read. Um, but it's, it's fantastic you were given this, I, like, this tool set and that you, you regard it as such. And to link it to what um, Bogomir was saying, this idea of eradicating the political as a kind of a certain nuance of dance, a certain quality of dance. I think that's, that also speaks to it. It's not just the way we speak, it's the way we move. It's the way we 
inhabit space. And then it, it's, a, it's a language that uh, e also today we only speak in English. Because for, for this exhibition, we mm. try to translate the, the basic uh, uh, terminology to, to Dutch, mm -hmm. which was actually, uh, it should be taught at school how to, to, to translate them, because that actually mm. forces you to find that all the different layers that are inside these words. And I just to say, I mean, about misfitting and fitting and yeah. it's lovely to hear joe talk about it because it's become a really key part of the kind of workshops that we run with something i co-founded called the disordinary architecture project which is a disabled artist becoming to working into architectural uh, and built environment practice and education and we use uh, because there's a very well-known disability study scholar called rosemary garland thompson who also uses this notion of fitting and misfitting and what's fantastic about it is it's like a light bulb moment you talk about it with students or with practitioners and they go oh and you can see that it has a real resonance with right across mainstream practice and mainstream education. It's not something that's kind of frightening or intimidating because it's relational. It's like it's about the situation that anybody is in, which is really what the built environment is. You, you misfit in certain situations. Probably everybody's experienced misfitting at some stage. So you can begin to draw out what it is. But you can also, the other thing that I think really powerful about it is... If you fit smoothly in the world, and if you reflect on fitting very smoothly in the world, actually you're the problem. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. If you don't have to yeah. notice stuff, you are the problem. And, and that includes, you know, myself as a middle class, white, older woman. There are things where I do fit very smoothly and I don't notice anything. That's a problem. And so it also means that you have a bit of a flip. Um, Non-normative, uh, marginalised groups are not the problem. And they're actually, if you have to negotiate as a, as a misfit, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's through creative dancing or through other sorts of campaigning or just how you live your life, that's very creative and we should be learning. That's a creative generator for designers, for planners, and it's completely not made use of. Mm -hmm. It's completely like it's a whole energy which we get with the artists in Disordinary and, and also disabled architects. It's fantastic to work in that setting because the energy is enormous and it just gets left out Realizing that, it, it took me your project, the school, actually, to see how concepts like misfitting, fitting, um, uh, uh, killed your space invaders, how it could actually transform into kind of a boundaryless architecture. Could you explain a bit about the school? Well, yes, we, we then discussed actually trying to think of positive examples <laughs> of some of the things that uh, we were talking about. And I was reflecting also on my own practice as an architect, uh, Burger Barnett Architects, and I was thinking, what have we done that might be construed as a non-straightening device in mm. architecture? And so one project that we have produced is the Veiled Bohm School, which is uh, two, which is, uh, two schools under one roof, two under a duck. Mm -hmm. uh, and one school is for mainstream children and one is for children with uh, special needs, special educational needs, very varied. But instead of putting one school, and they share lots of um, uh, facilities within the, the school, like the hall, the aula, the library, there's a little library, there's um, a kitchen for the aulas, the parents when they drop off the children, all sorts of things. But instead of just leaving it at that, we actually dovetail the spaces together. So in fact, children of, were of learn, learning difficulties uh, or have special needs, are their rooms and spaces are embedded within the classrooms of all the other children. So actually they cross each other physically and uh, in all sorts of ways within the actual physical environment, rather than being two halves that waved at each other across the uh, open courtyard of how this, this vocabulary can actually turn into, let's yeah. say, buildings. And then buildings are kind of a visible manifestation. They will be archived. And then we are back, let's say, in well the kind of way we know and are used to think. Uh, just to uh, kind of conclude this event, at least uh, online, um, 
what has this learned as the, 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 the feminist uh, history uh, in, in, in activism, uh, in, in, in building, in designing, in um, making communities, and, uh, and, uh, and the, all the words that are connected to it in, 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 in feminist theory, in, in archiving, how can we use this unboxing theory? Where archiving is kind of boxing as a as a thing in, 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 in inherently, let's say. So wh how how wh what what would, would be interesting approaches in archiving all these knowledge and examples? Yeah, again, a huge question, and I think I mean we're just beginning uh, a, a project at the Barbican together with the Bartlett um, Faculty of Built Environment called Opening Up the Archive, and and of course mm -hmm. there's a huge amount. Again, this is a huge amount of work going on internationally, mm -hmm. but I think it is. Uh, Obviously, some of it is, as Ali was saying, about shifting the canon, mm -hmm. but some of it is about how you archive process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, for example, the dance, I think, is a really interesting one. How you archive, what it is where you're archiving um, things that are going on, which are not just uh, a kind of, there it is, it's a representation, but are actually um, a form of sharing mm -hmm. and a form of campaigning. And one of the... Uh, um, one of the commissions that we're doing is is somebody who's really looking at archives for trans people as a kind of form of survival mm -hmm. yeah. but actually archives are not just this thing that is about storing something and keeping it for uh, future posterity sure, yes. but it's something you need now yeah. for survival yeah. you need to hear what other people are saying you need to be exactly. and this is literally about yeah. sharing things yeah. it's about what are the yeah. what are the artifacts that you use as part of that whole uh, way of being and and how you might help each other but also share so for me, it's completely, it's really moving the notion of the archive mm. way beyond, I think, where I started. And I thought I started somewhere quite, you know, advanced. And of course, no, th there's some really radical thought going on in that field. Really. And, and, and how, do you, how do you deal with that, Ali, in, in, your, in mean, your limitations as a I researcher and a curator? Sure, <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with Joss entirely. I think it's, um, archives are very much a, a living thing. There are things that should evolve, and and an archivist knows that nothing really kind of just sits in a box and collects dust unless you don't have the funds to go back to it and really kind of reevaluate what that object, what that kind of micro kind of historical document does and what it what it should do. Um, I believe, like anything, I mean, these things become indicative of their time. If something was archived in the 70s, it could be potentially be viewed with in a, with a completely different set of eyes now. And that doesn't mean you change the document. It doesn't mean you change the artifact in itself, but our appreciation of those objects changes. And it opens up so many dynamic new fields of research, so many dynamic new um, kind of tool sets with which to really interrogate the present and potentially impact the future. And, and do you think that this, this, this awareness uh, would also help in uh, expressing or addressing or criticizing otherwise? knowing that you need different ways of, well, make it, to well, make it into the so. future. Well, hopefully so. <laughs> Otherwise, architects <laughs> wouldn't have a job and researchers <laughs> wouldn't have <laughs> projects to work on. Um. I think it's difficult thinking about how we make this visible in the future mm. because we're in the digital age and uh, we're past the stage of the flyer, you know, of demonstrations. And, oh. how, it, and it's very easy for a lot of information, even though it, there is a lot of information, it's very easy to lose it. Yes. Mm. And how mm. do we access it? Mm. And how do we save it? And how do we, it has to be very visible. So. And that is really, uh, really hard, I think. Mm. And I think a lot is getting lost. Mm. And, Although a lot is being recorded, it's almost being lost in the melee of uh, the huge opportunities we have to record, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. Yeah, in the waves of, of mass information and, and mass knowledge exactly. that's really yeah. Yeah. Like indicative of our time. And I also, I mean, there's also a thing about what is recorded and, and, and you know, the same thing still goes on, even though there's a huge amount more of it. Mm. Uh, I, we've just been working with a group called the East End Women's Museum, uh, which is almost entirely virtual, but they, it's just a group of women who are like, women's, if you look, women's stories are never, ca you know, and particularly women mm. of colour, and th they're not captured, so like we, mm. have to, we have to be recording narratives mm -hmm. now. We have to make a deliberate effort to record narratives in where, you know... The, the like oral histories. Oral yeah. histories, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. basically, yeah. kind of uh, witness mm. accounts. Yeah. We need to 
Uh, so at least they're stored. Mm -hmm. At least yes. they actually exist because, of course, you know, huge amounts of, you know, there are no stories for, um, the, you know, the life of enslaved people. You know, mm. there are no stories for uh, huge numbers of indigenous peoples. You mm. know, there are, so it's, this is like a really tiny thing that they're doing, this small mm. local group, which is like, we just want to make sure there are some stories mm -hmm. from where we live. All these micro histories. That yeah, yeah, goes back yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah so, so um, we are at the end of this uh, incredibly interesting conversation. So just to, to, to round off, it, it, it starts with unboxing, maybe in so many ways, like mm. not in, in, in any possible meaning of unboxing, maybe like uh, uh, in the Safe Space exhibition only until Sunday uh, and the Barbican in, uh, uh, until December 23, I think. 23th, yep. Yeah. Uh, oh wow. So if, if you have the opportunity to go to London, please uh, have a look at, yeah. at, at, at Joss's uh, exhibition. Mm. And it also uh, is happening uh, at the New Institute with different ways of archiving. It's happening uh, in your a critical research uh, a collective uh, it's happening in your practice so um, let's uh, end on a kind of positive note <laughs> thank you very much uh, for being here for sharing all your thoughts and ideas on uh, on, the, on the feminist practice in in history and in future and uh, let's uh, uh, meet again very very soon yeah. thank you very much thank you thank you bye bye.